to know you as Lord and Saviour. Um, those who've heard my lecture before uh, and know my notes that I have on the subject, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to <clears throat> Um, add stuff in that's not in my notes and in my lecture. Um, Josh McDowell was a student and he writes on December 19th 1959 at 8 30 p.m. during my second year at the university I became a Christian. That night I prayed. I prayed four things in order to establish a relationship with God in a personal relationship with Son with his son, the personal resurrected living Christ. Over a period of time, that relationship turned my life around. First, I prayed, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross. For I confess those things in my life that aren't pleasing to you. And I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me. The Bible says, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Isaiah 1.18 um, third, I said, right now, in the best way I know how, I open the door of my heart and life, and I trust you as my Savior and Lord. Take control of my life. Change me from outside. Make me the type of person you created me to be. The last thing I prayed was, thank you for coming into my life by faith. It was a faith produced by the Holy Spirit based on God's word and supported by evidence in the facts of history. Read, um evidence demands a verdict. The reason why I quote Josh McDowell there is this man as a student investigated whether Jesus rose from the dead. He, he, he was challenged so he went and studied the subject. He actually became convinced that Christ rose from the dead by looking at the evidence. And I would encourage you that if you honestly uh, look at the evidence <clears throat> then you will find the truth. Now, first of all, I want to say <clears throat> that we have to consider um, presuppositions. We have to be honest <clears throat> and we have to consider our presuppositions. The idea that a, an atheist or a Christian or anybody comes to history without some kind of bias is just not correct. We come to historical information, all of us, with a bias. Dale Allison, a formidable scholar in his paper, The Historical Christ, March 6, 2012, Duke University, noticed that Orthodox scholars produce a Jesus that fits their creed, and the skeptics produce Jesus to fit their ideologies. For example, the Irish scholar Dominic Crossan writes a life of Christ as an Irish revolutionary is un, who is under imperial Rome. Do you see what I mean? He, he, Crossan is culture and his understanding of life shapes the way he understands the historical material about Christ. We have H. Ramirez in 1694 to 1768. He wrote a life of Christ as a Jewish revolutionary. D. F. Strauss, 1808-74, he writes the life of Christ as a, as a myth, as, as, um, and, and in 1823-92, he wrote a life that, of Christ and said that Jesus was a romantic visionary. H. J. Holtzman, 1832-1910, wrote a life of Christ and said Jesus was the teacher of timeless ethical truth. Johann Weiss, 1863 to 1940, Jesus was an eschatological teacher, a figure who should be um, fitted into the first century Judaism. Albert Schweitzer, 1875-1865, Jesus failed, was a failed prophet but towering personality. And we need to go back to the Jewish context and avoid the early church historical spin. Rudolf Boltman, 1884, 1976, saw Jesus as a preacher of timeless truth, but it was his existential philosophy 
that was his hermeneutic in understanding who Jesus was. So, what your intellectual horizons are, what your culture is, will shape the way you view Jesus. We see this with the new atheist. We, we see um, the British scientist Richard Dawkins considered Jesus as a product of the later church, a mythical figure who might have existed. He gave no analysis of any historical data in depth in his book, The God Delusion. The British journalist and writer Christopher Hitchens in 13th of April 1949 to the December 2011 in his book, God is Not Great, in page 40, 51, 60, 64, 68, 89, 109 to 23, 125, 128, 130, 152, 158, and 159. Uh, in his attack, Hitchens says that Jesus was an avatar of Seth, a Gnostic invention who makes more sense than any early church fabrication. He quotes Bart Ehrman, but doesn't engage with any other scholars. He obviously is biased and only using one scholar and using scholarship that he doesn't really fully understand. Just an aside, um, the four Gospels are quoted by the Gnostic Gospels. That would absolutely destroy these uh, ideas that Hitchens wrote in his book about Jesus. The American writer Sam Harris in his book End of Faith on page 35 uh, page 96, 97, page 82, 83, 156, 57, 158, 241, two, um, as a Jew, but politicizes him at every turn. He understands Jesus' divinity and death as political tools used by the church against the Jews, a theological anti Semitism. Michael Onfray, the French philosopher, in his book Atheist Manifesto, page 115, 127, said Jesus' existence has not been historical historically established. He makes great, sweet, great sweeping claims but fails to cite scholars evidence to back up what he says. He's even been noted to get his facts wrong. He said there was no such thing as a crucifixion in the early first century uh, Jerusalem. Um, Josephus said the Jews are so careful about funeral rites that even malefactors have been sentenced to crucifixion are taken down and buried before sunset. Josephus, Jewish War, 4317. So, and we also found a, a crucifer, a, a foot with a, 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 cruti, a, a, a nail through, which showed there was crucifixion at that time. So what we've done is we've looked at the New Atheist, we've looked at the history of scholarship on Jesus, and we've looked that it's all been biased. Um, the New Atheist, um, all four of the ones that we just looked at, on Frey and Hitchin, Sam Harris and Dawkins, uh, have not done any extensive study on Jesus. All four ignore engaging with scholars who might disagree with them. All four are polemical, have a polemical agenda against religion. They tend to read the life of Jesus in the light of their political struggle against religion in the present. They tend to attack the virgin birth and see that the main evidence against Jesus being a real historical feat. Um, and see that as the main historical figure. The rest of Jesus' life is superficially treated only to make a political point against religion in the present. This can hardly be seen as fair, objective, historical treatment of the life of Jesus. Then we have the Bayes theorem. Uh, in the debate, James White asked Dominic Crossan about bias in historical method. Dominic Crossan replied, we have presuppositions, but we also have data. That's in the resurrection debate, Crossan and Borg versus White and Renehan. This debate took place on board ship 2005 in the Gulf of Alaska. You can see it on YouTube channel Alaska 1689. Crossan 
implied that we can get the historical data even with bias. Uh, just an aside though, it's interesting that Dominic well, even in his work, if you look at uh, a book called The Cambridge Studies, Cambridge Companion to Jesus, in the first chapter, Dr. Evans writes an article, and there he critiques Dominic Crossan, showing that Dominic Crossan, when he says that Jesus was a Sionic philosopher, if you look at the Galilean architecture, Roman and Greek architecture in, Gal in, in the area of Galilee, Crossan would say that shows that there was Sionic teaching and ideas, and Jesus was a Sionic philosopher. Uh, wandering from a peasant village. But all the evidence indicates, even though they were Greek and Roman architecture, that the people there were thoroughly Jewish. All the archaeological evidence for funerals, uh, for burials, all reveal a Jewish culture. So, in other words, Dominic Crossan is not as objective as he even thinks. The point what I'm getting at is most scholars are not aware, even historians and even historical Jesus experts are not aware and as honest as they need to be about their bias. How are they shaping, how are our presuppositions shaping the material that we look at? What steps have we taken to make sure that our presuppositions are not blinding our interpretation of the facts? Have we consistently looked at our presuppositions to see if our presuppositions are consistent? Because not all presuppositions are accurate. As we've looked at the historical Jesus studies and the New Atheists, we all have to be more conscious of our bias, more honest and upfront about it, or we'll go around in circles confirming what we want to believe rather than letting the evidence speak for itself. Scholars try to trick the public into thinking they are more objective than they are. An example is the scholar who used Bay theorem, the atheist Dr. Richard Carrier, and there are Christians who've done the same, using the Bay theorem as if this is an objective way to show that Christianity, uh, that atheism is correct in its interpretation of Jesus. This theorem tries to show the probability of each set of probable causes for an observed outcome can be logically uh, ascertained from knowledge of the probability of each cause and the conditional probability of the um, understanding of the outcome of each cause. To be fair, it must also be noted that evangelical scholars have also used the Bayes theorem to prove their case for the resurrection. I have to say that again. But the Bayes theorem is not used by any known historian. Uh, it's not used by any reputable historian, really. Or if it is, it's very rare. Mo most historians don't use it. What this argument is from the Bayes theorem is an argument from um, scientism. Susan Hack, an atheist, has given a great lecture in warning us about using science as some authority to give our ideas more kudos than in reality. Science does not, act, does not actually substantiate but remains neutral on the resurrection of Christ. If you look at Susan Hack's Six Signs of Scientism, Dr. Hack's talk at the, Rock, at the Rockman Institute of Philosophy at the University of Western Ontario on January the 7th, 2000. 11. Engages scientism, the view that natural science is the most authoritative way of looking at the world interpretations of life. What I'm trying to say is the atheists like Richard Carrier, who would try and use some kind of scientific basis to critique the resurrection, i.e. use the base theorem, it's only a form of scientism. It's only a form of trying to use science as an authority. But the base theorem is not actually scientific in terms of historical inquiry, it's very subjective. Um, David Bartholomew, uh, a, a, a statistician, uh, in page 117 of the Resurrection of Jesus in Mike Lacona's IVP book, 
writes, the great difficulty applying the theory is that it's often not at all clear what value should be given to the prior probability. David Balafonu says, thus the base theorem is subjective, page 117, Lycona, the resurrection of Jesus. Dr. McClough says, virtually no historian uses it, page 117 in uh, Lacona's book, Resurrection of Jesus. Dr. Tucker says it is clear how Bayes' theorem can be worked. It is unclear how Bayes' theorem can be worked out in practice. Page 117, Resurrection of Jesus. So we've got to acknowledge that we have presuppositions. We've got to acknowledge that we come to the historical information with pre-ideas. Now, does that mean to say that if all these history of all these scholars shows that they're biased, does that mean that we can't get to historical facts or information? No. What it means is that we have to be aware of whether our presuppositions are consistent and the best presuppositions, and we have to also try to make sh limit our presuppositions in the evaluation of the facts to be honest and fair. The atheist position, generally not all atheists, but the atheists that we dealt with here, the Sam Harris and Dawkins and Onfre and Hitchens, would see reality as materialistic. They would all be committed to evolution. These are their presuppositions. Now is that consistent for historical inquiry? If we believe in evolution, then there is no meaning ultimate to life. There is no general pattern to history. So why would we try to look at history for a pattern, history for a meaning, if our own intellectual foundation doesn't provide that? Our presupposition is in conflict. There is a a, a disparity between our presupposition and the actual historical inquiry. The Christian position says that history has a purpose and the Christian position has the uh, presupposition that reality is real and that when we investigate it we can come to knowledge so it is a basis for objective knowledge. So the actually um, the Christian presupposition actually is the better presupposition to go and do history than an atheist position or a skeptical position. Now, this is not because all as atheism is is an absence of belief due to a lack of evidence. But what the atheist doesn't realize is that that doesn't wash because one has to deconstruct the language that the atheist is using. That requires intellectual tools of philosophy, linguistics. It's not enough, it's not as simple as to say, I don't believe in God due to a lack of evidence. In other words, the point is that the atheist, <coughs> whether they like it or not, will have presuppositions that impinge on their understanding of reality and that impinge on whether their presuppositions are consistent in the historical task. So there has to be a discussion on the table about the atheist presupposition and the Christian presupposition. Other presuppositions that uh, play for the Christian is the Bible. For the Christian, the Bible is the Word of God. The Old Testament is the outline to the New Testament, etc. For the Christian presupposition, there is a belief in God, the Creator. For the atheist, there's often a, a presupposition that religion is no good and is controlling. So all these presuppositions play and have a role in our interpretation of the facts. They have to be on the table for discussion before we get to the historical task. I would say that the Christian position is a positive position providing a positive epistemology 
a positive historiography in order to do historical thinking. I would say that it's the only way Christianity gives you a grand narrative of history. That is to say that history has an, a meaning and a purpose and is moving towards a meaning and purpose. And if that's the case, that it means that if I'm doing historical inquiry, that it is purposeful, meaningful, and provides real knowledge. But if I believe in evolution, if I believe that history is not going anywhere, then why would I want to try and understand the past? The other thing in historical inquiry is that is secondly is the enlightenment had a big influence on how we understand history. The enlightenment was a particular cultural phenomena and yet that particular cultural phenomena has if that particular cultural phenomena is biased. Why is the Enlightenment position more superior than say a Japanese historian's methodology or a Chinese historian's methodology? So the Enlightenment presuppositions have to be critiqued before we do historical inquiry and debate whether Jesus rose from the dead. So the atheist assumes the Enlightenment position but the Enlightenment position can be challenged on many fronts. For example the Enlightenment split reason and morality. It made a dichotomy between what is human. It put more value on reason than anything else. But actually human beings are actually not only reasonable, they are moral. And you cannot have reason without morality or morality without reason. But morality is at the heart of every intellectual task. You cannot do science without being honest. You cannot do philosophy you cannot do history without being honest. In other words, morality is at the very core of how we know. And the atheist position puts tremendous emphasis on reason and tremendous emphasis on the material understanding of the universe from a scientific perspective, which goes directly back to the Enlightenment position. But the Christian position is that we are not only rational, we are moral, that we live in a moral universe. This position is consistent as we look at the reality of each position. If the position of the atheist is correct about history, that is to say we have evolved, then that is to say that the reality of contingent uh, information is based on pure cause and effect of the, the implication of that is that the human human beings do not have free will that they are products of their environment they are products of DNA but they are just part of the material cause and effect that is the problem with the materialist perspective on life and it impinges on our historical task because why should we do historical task? Because A, we are not moral, because we have no free will. But the Christian position is that the universe is a moral universe, that we are morally accountable, that when we make decisions and do decisions, we are free to do so. That means when we inquire in the historical task, we are looking at the actions, the free actions of human beings and are able to assess them and we can assess them in order to make choices, free choices in the present. So as we can see that the Christian presuppositions are actually more aimable to the historical task than an atheist presupposition. So presuppositions, whether the atheist likes it or not, or whether the skeptic likes it or not, presuppositions have to be debated and discussed. But does that mean we cannot come to a, uh, an objective understanding of history? What it means is we can come to the facts of history. But it, it just means that our bias will taint those facts. And so we have to be aware of how our presuppositions 
are tainting the facts and we have to make sure that we limit them to a certain extent but there is a, a value and central and important debate as to say to ask the question whose presuppositions are more consistent with the historical task this is a big debate that is not debated on campuses amongst atheists and Christians it is a big debate that is not properly been done in the academic world and needs to be done much more. Most academics will spend some time on their presuppositions but the vast majority of academics do not do enough reflection on their presuppositions and if they did they would actually adopt different methodology, different presupposition if they realized how inconsistent the presuppositions are, especially in the nature I could go on more and expand on that much more, but I'll leave it there for discussion and debate for anybody who wants to engage with me on that. Please feel free to make comments. If you make stupid comments, you'll be blocked. But I will leave this comment section open for anybody who wants to engage in the debate about presuppositions and the historical task. So we have to consider presuppositions and then secondly we have to think about methodology. Our methodology of how we engage in um, the historical task is important. Uh, the criteria that we use, the way we tackle the information is important. Often, and I've listened to many, many debates on the resurrection, methodology, if it is mentioned, it's very rare, maybe a little bit, and often it's just to score points against each other in debate. But methodology is important. There is a responsibility in debates on the resurrection to lay down what your methodology is and to explain to the public why you've adopted a particular methodology. Out of many, many debates that I have seen on the resurrection of Christ, debates between skeptics and Christians, methodology is not, a, is not dealt with as much as it should be. If you're going to use a methodology such as the Bayes theorem like Richard Carey, the atheist, it is beholden on you to be intellectually honest and to inform the public that your methodology is not used by most historians. A methodology, it should have a hermeneutical aspect, it should have historical criteria. What do I mean by comprehensive? Adolf Schlatter of 16th of August 1852 to 19th of May 1938 wrote over 400 papers on New Testament theology and New Testament studies. He ranked as one of the great theologians of modern times equal to that of Bultmann. His historical method is used in my debates. I have wanted to debate many atheists but I've not been able to find many who were willing to debate me on the resurrection but if they were to debate me on the resurrection part of my methodology is using Schlatter, Adolf Schlatter. He, ad he advises the avoidance of sectarian bias that you study all relevant material before you come to a conclusion. He seeks to understand the historical context of any ancient text. It gives equal time to primary source material and secondary source. Having a rich interplay between primary source historical material and contemporary scholars. Very often you will find with the atheist that number one they do not pay careful attention to historical data. So, for example, you will find, and I've checked 
all the time I have checked with Richard Carrier, an atheist, his use of quotations from uh, the book of I uh, the Song of Isaiah and other ancient texts, and every time correct. So it's important to pay particular attention to the historical data that we're looking at and to quote it in context, which most of the time the skeptics fail to do. But at the same time we must be intellectually honest and we must be willing to engage with the wider scholarly community. This again is one of the great weaknesses of the atheist community. If you read the atheist community or the skeptical community in the critique of Christianity uh, on the resurrection of Christ, you will find how very limited in their intellectual apparatus that they have. They cannot or very rarely will engage with the wider scholarly community. And so you have fringe scholars like Richard Carrier and agnostic scholars like um, what's his name? Um, Dr. Price, who are so fringe and, and, and incapable of actually engaging in the more richer, wider scholarly community. Uh, Dr. Price has been associated with the Jesus Seminar. That is a very limited part of the scholarly world in historical Jesus studies. So if you're going to debate on the resurrection of Christ, if you're going to show yourself to be competent, you need to be show that you've engaged with a wider scholarly community. For example, in this paper, I've mentioned Dominic Crossan, who I've consistently studied his material. I have mentioned Dale Allison, whose material I have studied. I have mentioned a whole variety of scholars that are completely different from my view, and I've honestly read them. And so your me methodology must be comprehensive and deep. And so my model is Adel Schlatter there. Secondly, you must have a methodology in understanding ancient text. It's no good quoting ancient text unless you put down and show us what you're using as a methodology. I use the historical grammatical method. I use a method where I try to look at ancient text, whether the Bible or anything else, in its historical grammatical context. That is very clear because often skeptics will quote text and we're not aware of the hermeneutical method they are using and how they use that method in the interpretation of and Hudwink by quotations from Bart Ehrman and by Richard Carrier, these kind of scholars who will quote a text but they are not giving us the methodology that they're using or, or, or and how they got to that quotation. If you want to know my methodology go and read the books by Dr. Bob Utley who is an expert. Uh, www.freebiblecommentary.org PDF seminar textbook by Dr. Bob Utley. So we, we, we have a methodology of depth, looking at primary source material and engaging with contemporary scholarship. We have a, a hermeneutic of historical grammatical method. We have a historical... We use a methodology that most scholars will use. I hope in my lecture to use the methods that historians use in assessing a hypothesis for historical data. This means my method tries to keep within the mainstream of historical scholarship. Also it is very important to note as we use the historian's tools it means we are using historical data as evidence not presuming or defending an inspired Bible. This is important because one or two skeptics have tried to straw man me here. They've tried to suggest that my belief in the Bible is the word of God is influencing my in my understanding of the historical data.
but I have been upfront and honest that I have presuppositions. But also the skeptic has to be honest that they have presuppositions. Discussion, even though my presupposition may be the inspired Bible, my argument does not rest on an inspired Bible, but upon historical method that secular historians use. So therefore this argument against me would be a straw man. Number one, the historical method that historians would generally use is number one, explanatory scope. This means we look at the quantity of the facts that our hypothesis accounts. The hypothesis that has the most relevant facts has the best explanatory scope. Second, explanatory power. This looks at quality of the given facts. If you can explain your position with a less ambiguity, then it has better explanatory power. If one has a strong presence, you may get some due to the nature of patchiness of history. The hypothesis conforms to the background knowledge better than any other position. We look at opposing views and see also if they conform, confirmed by anything in history or today by sciences. Fourth, hat less ad hoc. We use less non-evidence assumptions. We are in a better position than using such arguments that like any evidence. And five, illumination. A hypothesis can provide good solutions to historical problems, and if this is the position, it strengthens one case. One's case. Page 109 to 111, The Resurrection of Jesus, Mike Lacona, A New Historical Approach, IVP 2010. Uh, in the paper, uh, a roundtable discussion with Mike Lacona, on the resurrection of Jesus. He says, when conducting authentic historical investigation, one cannot presuppose that the source with which we are working are ignorant or divinely inspired. Otherwise, we would simply conclude everything reported in those sources is true and wrap up the investigation. A theologian can do that when studying Jesus. A historian does not have that luxury. Theology and history are different disciplines with different objectives and approaches. Now, I believe that everything in the Bible is true, but that's a statement of faith and has to be argued by reason of a different sort. My object in the book was to see what I could prove concerning Jesus' resurrection with reasonable and adequate historical certainty apart from any faith commitment. My approach is a little bit nuanced than Lycona. I recognize actually in ancient historiography and in present historiography there is always theological reflection. The historian has ever written in history without putting their interpretation. Interpretation is theological reflection. It is a theological, it is not historical. So you cannot have history without information and facts and interpretation. It is not possible. So I would disagree a little bit with my friend Mike Lacona. Not, not my friend personally, but a, a man who I greatly respect. What I would say is that we all, whether skeptic or not, all are influenced by our biases, but that we can look at historical facts and come to some objective understanding, but we have to recognize that our presuppositions will be there and influence our interpretation. You can never completely get away from presuppositions. You can never completely get to the facts without being influenced by presuppositions. But at the same time, we can look at reality of the facts. They are there, facts are facts. But there is a tension, there is an interplay between facts and presuppositions. So my position is much more nuanced and much more subtle than Mike Lacona's. But we have a criteria that the secular historians use and we use that in our historical di discussion. The next, we build on the facts that we already know. Dr. E.P. Sanders 
as noted has noted a number of facts facts that the scholarly world generally agree with now what the atheists do not tell you what the secular scholars do not tell you who are anti-christianity they do not tell you that the vast majority of these scholars who write on the resurrection like Dr. Carrier Bill Doherty, David Fitzgerald, Robert, Dr. Robert Price, all these skeptics reject the main body of facts that the academic world already acknowledges. E.P. Sanders set, gives these facts. Number one, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. Number two, Jesus was a Galilean who preached and did healings. Number three, Jesus had 12 disciples according to him. Number four, Jesus did his work for Israel. Number five, Jesus was controversial at the temple. Six, Jesus was crucified outside Jerusalem by Roman authorities after his death. Jesus followed as a movement. And finally, a group of Jews persecuted at least part of the new movement. Galatians chapter 1, 13, 22, Philippians 3, 6. The persecution continued up to the end of Paul's career, 2 Corinthians 11, 24. Galatians 5, 11, 6, 12, Matthew 23, 34. E.P. Sanders, 1985, Jesus and Jude Judaism, uh, Philadelphia Fortress Press. And just a little aside, notice how I'm using a wide variety of scholars. Notice how I'm interacting with a wider scholarly community. Virtually no atheist on the internet or even the atheist scholars will do what I've done in quoting such a wide variety of scholars and engage with them. So we've looked at presuppositions, we've looked at methodology. And now let's just look at some of the data, the evidence for the resurrection. Now, all what I've done and given to you today, I offered to debate Aaron Ra and he ran away from a debate with me because he knew he couldn't beat, beat me in debate on this. I had a, a debate with DPR Jones, I beat him in debate. I only touched on the resurrection a little bit. I had a, a discussion with um, Ozzy on the historical aspects of Jesus. I had a discussion with Thunderfoot. But none of these atheists, none of these atheists in any way, in any way tackled my scholarship my arguments and what I had to say on the resurrection of Christ. No proper debates were provided for so that we could discuss this topic in a very scholarly academic way. The atheist community completely and utterly run from these challenges for debates. Only recently John McDropout challenged uh, took on the challenge for a debate and I would actually love to debate him and I've said I would debate him and given him uh, I said to him that I would debate him but when you have idiots ride into the city center and try to film your atheists when you have that kind of pressure put on you with silly accusations and all that kind of stuff going on and people like John Mc drop out um, commentating on archive channels that are in the kind of uh, behavior then I'm not going to be willing to debate someone unless they make it clear that they disassociate themselves from that kind of culture but basically the atheist community the skeptical community has not in any shape or form in any way dealt with the issues that I've just mentioned before we even get onto the evidence they have not dealt with presuppositions they have not dealt with methodology in any shape or form the best that they can do is quote Earl Doherty 
or a richer carrier or a price. But there has been no in-depth debate and discussion on the issues that I brought forward. But there was a tacit running away from the skeptic and an endorsement of drama and cyberbullying against me. And the scholarship that I had to bring on this subject was completely ignored when people realized that, hey, oh, this guy actually knows what he's talking about. And if we continue to discuss with him, we're going to be educating people and we don't want them to be educated in the kind of scholarship that this guy is going to bring. And so I was excluded from the conversation. So, so we'll look at some of the evidence for the resurrection. Um, first of all, the four Gospels can be early first century and can be shown to be of eyewitness material. I could go on and on and on of the litany of information here. Uh, if you want to get a general outline, um, you can look at Wallace's paper on uh, tracing the eyewitness accounts, the Gospels, back to the first century as a very popular look at. But you can find that the four Gospels can be traced back to the early first century and traced back as eyewitness material. From a historical point of view, that's pretty amazing. You, you don't normally get that kind of quality information on a topic. Um, I, I could go on and on and on, uh, but we'll just mention 120 AD, Polycarp, a disciple of the Apostle John, in his letter on the Gospels and other New Testament books. Basically, it's over 19,000 times the early church fathers quote from the Gospels. You can look at the Didache teaching text used widely by the church. The writer quotes from Matthew on the Lord's Prayer. That puts them, the Gospel to 95 AD. Uh, Matthew's quoted in 1 Clement 13, 1, 2. All this evidence shows that the Gospels are first century documents. They are written when the life witnesses were around. Scholars that believe that the Gospels are from an early date are John W. Wainham, Professor of New Testament Greek, Berg Gerdesen, Swedish scholar, at Professor at Lund University, Marcel Jaus, a, F a French biblical scholar, Karsten Peter Thied, German papyriologist. You want to look at the more popular level, look at the early eyewitnesses of Jesus by J. Warner Wallace. Ignatius' letter to Trillian uh, in 9.4 we read Jesus Christ was of the stock of David who was from Mary who was truly born, ate, drank, was truly persecuted under Pontius Pilate, was truly crucified and died, who also was truly raised from the dead, his father raising him. What does this, that, that's www.earlywritings.com, Ignatius. What, what does this evidence prove about the Gospels and the early church fathers here. Well, first of all, it proves that the Gospels are first century documents. Secondly, it proves that these Gospels were authoritative. And thirdly, it proves that these Gospels had a general historical narrative that is consistent across the board uh, and, and can be compared to other data which confirms that this is highly unlikely uh, it was an invention. If this story of the death and resurrection of Christ is consistent throughout a variety of documents in the second century and in the first century, it gives you a clear indication that those events took place. Secondly, the nature of the Gospels the, the Gospels text 
are historical, historically reliable. Now here is an important debate that I had with some atheists such as Thunderfoot and Ozzy and all the rest of them. And the kind of laughable arguments that they would use where Thunderfoot would say that comics can have historical facts in them but it doesn't mean that Spider-Man rose from the dead or whatever. Well first of all the Gospels are a particular genre of literature. Comics are a particular genre of literature. Comics are comics. Everybody knows what a comic is. The Gospels are a particular genre of literature. So right off the bat people like Thunderfoot and Ozzy need to reconsider their silly arguments. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a decoration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. Luke is basically saying, look, I'm writing a document of history here based on eyewitness material. That's the genre of the literature. So when skeptics kind of come and say, oh, well, you're going to present facts to prove that the Gospels are historically reliable, but that doesn't prove Jesus rose from the dead. What it proves is the underlying textual base of the Gospels is reliable. And it shows that the right and had integrity and it gives strength to their testimony that Jesus rose from the dead. So it actually is a very important plank of the debate and argument and cannot be dismissed as easily as Ozzy and Thunderfoot did uh, prior to Christmas. So there are many historical facts, there are countless facts in the Gospels that have been confirmed. I could go on and on and on, uh, the pool, the uh, in John chapter 144 uh, in Bethesda there is talk about fishing in that area, uh, fishing implements in a house in Bethesda. Now you might say well why is that important? It's showing that the Gospels are historically accurate when they talk about the culture. Minor details that are mentioned in the Gospels, if they're confirmed in history, shows you that there's an intricacy there that you cannot get by fiction. In John chapter 2 verse 1 and 11 They found uh, storage, uh, storage where uh, storage pots, just like you see in the story uh, in Canaan in John chapter two, verse one and eleven. Pool of Bethesda. John describes it as near um, near the sheep gate. The discovery of the pool shows beyond doubt John was right. Tiberius John is the John identified the Sea of Galilee as the Sea of Tiberius, getting the exact kind of language of that time in John six one, John twenty one one. He got Herod Antipas, Tetrarch of Galilee and Perea 
before BC AD 39, moved his house, as it were, his capital from Sephora to Tiberius in AD 24. So John gets the political times right very clearly. The Gospels talk about Pontius Pilate. We find an inscription about that. We, the Gospels talk about Jesus going to the temple to discuss. We find the very stairways where people taught and sat at the temple to discuss. We found a Galilean boat in Luke 5, 1 to 11. Uh, archaeologically. And we even found maybe Peter's house in Mark 9, 1. Von Wallard writes, almost all scholars now espouse this view. So, I could go on and on and on. Uh, if, you, if you read Craig Blomberg's um, book on um, the atrocity of the Gospels, um, you will find time after time after time the Gospels get it right historically. I've, tried, I've gone into depth on the Quirinius census, uh, by the way, if you want to look at that, if you look at my videos on Jesus, uh, uh, Cambridge Companion to Jesus. But the point is that um, there's countless facts verified in the Gospels, historical facts, and minor details that people who are making things up wouldn't get correct. And there has to be an acknowledgement that there is historical accuracy within the Gospels. Now, There has been an unbalanced, an, in, an, an injustice and an imbalance concerning the Gospels. Since Paul, a lot of biblical scholarship and historical Jesus studies was influenced by post-enlightenment thinking and was anti-church, and so believed that it should get behind the Gospels and get to the true source material. And it was to ignore the church's perspective on the Gospels. But what that did is it began to take apart intricately analyzing every bit and part of the Gospels, never accepting any of it as historically accurate. Now, because of the 1920s, when uh, Jew Jewish scholars wrote the lives of Jesus from a Jewish perspective, and that scholarship was discovered in the 1950s and 60s, it began to dawn on scholars that Rudolf Bultmann and the form critics were actually not correct in their assessment of the Gospels. Bultmann assessed that the Gospels were actually uh, that the, he, he believed in Greek culture and that anything that was Jewish was not historically accurate. But because of the revival of Jewish scholarship in the 50s and 60s, scholars realized Bultmann and the form critics were wrong that there was actually a Jewish context to the Gospels. What that did then, it made scholars realize there was actually more historical content within the Gospels than was given credence. My argument and, and contention against atheists and skeptics who would say that we look at the Gospels piecemeal, that is the historical method, and that we look at every individual bit and assess it on its merits is not completely fair because we won't do that with completely with ancient historians. There'll be some ancient historians are generally accurate and we'll take large chunks of what they're saying as accurate because we know that they would generally go and investigate and they would generally be be fair with their sources. We might be spot various biases, we might be able to spot indiscretion or compromises or whatever, but we'll have a general trust of an author or not. And I think the in, injustice with the Gospels is since the Enlightenment there was an utter radical skepticism. And I think that, pendulum, that, that legacy is with us today and I think it has to change. 
I think there has to be a much more readiness to accept from the skeptics and from academics that the Gospels are generally trustworthy in their historical information. And if that's the case, it means you should be much more open to the data that is given about Jesus' miracles and about the resurrection. So it's a case of do you take a skeptical position or do you take a more of innocent till proven guilty? And I think the fair option in looking at the gospel documents is to say innocent till proven guilty rather than the radical skepticism that many skeptics use it's just a, a complete unfairness to the fact that we are finding continually the Gospels as being accurate historically. That's a very important point, a nuanced point in this debate on did Jesus rise from the dead. It is true to say that we look at detailed historical data on their own terms, but it is also true to say that there are some writers that we know are more trustworthy than others. And so the question has to be up, as we look at the detailed information, are these writers trustworthy or not? That has to be answered, and the skeptics quickly put that under the carpet and don't put it up for debate. Because if they did, if the evidence goes one way, it means it's the end of the debate for the skeptic. Now, if we look at the Gnostic Gospels, we can compare the difference between the four Gospels. And we can find that when the Gospels mention, um, for example, in contrast, we find the Gnostic texts do not anchor Jesus in historical time. For example, Pilate is not mentioned at all. Galilee comes only once in the Gnostic text. As for biblical Gospels, Pilate appears about 60 times. And I could go on and on and on about more information about that. So the Gnostic Gospels show that they have no real historical integrity whatsoever. Then finally, we find that the Gospels are rooted in eyewitness material. Richard Balcom says, it is the contention of this book that in the period up to the writing of the Gospel, Gospel traditions were connected with the name and known eyewitnesses, people who had heard the teaching of Jesus from, Jesus from his lips and committed it to memory, people who had witnessed the events of his ministry, death, resurrection, and themselves had formulated the stories about these events that they told. These eyewitnesses did not merely set going a process of oral transmission that soon went its own way without reference to them. They remained throughout their lifetime a source that may have varied for figures of central and more marginal significance. The authoritative guarantors of the stories they continued to tell Richard Balcom, Jesus and the eyewitnesses, the gospel as eyewitnesses, Grand Rapids, Ehrman, 2006. Uh, in Richard Balcom's book, uh, basically, he's challenging the form critics. The form critics would say, and a lot of skepticism would say, that Jesus developed as a myth by a competing number of storytellers, principally in the plural. There were these communities, and we don't know who they were, who wrote these stories about Jesus, and that's how things developed. In noting the historical research of Papias, who was mentioned by Eusebius, and Papias mentions that he talks to the daughters of Philip and tries to get eyewitness material about Jesus Christ. Balcom also notes in ancient, uh, ancient historiography that since Polybius, uh, Polybius in 200 BC or maybe a bit more, believed that if you're going to be a good historian, you had to look at eyewitness material. So based on these two researches, one uh, Papias and Eusebius to uh, the research done on 
how ancient historians work uh, based on Burridge's book and also if you look at the four lectures of um, Dr. Balcom at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary on the Gospels as history you'll get an understanding of this debate. So what you find is because of this research there's a strong case that the Gospels are based on eyewitness material. You can see this in the Gospel of Mark and this is quoting uh, Richard Balcom. Mark writes in a similar way to historians of his time. He uses the narrative methods of inclusio, a historical method of his time. Peter is made central in this inclusio, which means it is was the eyewitness material being etc. You can go into in depth look at this in Richard Balcon's book. So basically I've provided a simple a couple of simple arguments. Number one, the gospels are in the first century. This is seen by the nineteen thousand quotes of the early church fathers from the second century. And so cannot be denied. We've seen secondly that based on the research of people like um, Richard Bauk, this material, and that we have to respect the authors as being trustworthy. We also saw that the resurrection in a, a large variety of uh, religious literature both from the first and second century have a consistent story of a Jesus dying and rising which points to a clear historical narrative that could not have been invented nor could have developed over time because there's so much cross-referencing of different historical documents religious documents So, it's a broad argument, it's a broad argument that I'm bringing based on Balcom's book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. So here's some of my other thoughts. In Mark chapter 14, verse 66 and 72, we know that the gospel is based on Peter's testimony. Why would Mark put in Peter's denial of Jesus if it did not happen? Also, why would Peter be a coward at the time of Jesus' death? So, sorry, here's my conclusions of this evidence. We've given the depth of the evidence of the historical variety of the gospel, veracity of the denied witness. Now here's the conclusion of what, what that gives us, what that helps us on the table. In Mark chapter 14, 66, 72, as we know that the gospel is based on Peter's testimony, why would Mark put in Peter's denial of Jesus if it did not happen? From Balkan's work we know, and from early tradition, many other sources we could go into if we wanted to, we know that the Gospel of Mark was written on the basis of Peter's testimony. 
So as we know that, why is it why is Mark put in the denial of Peter? Why put it in if it didn't happen? It would be propaganda. So it has a strong historical base. Also, why would Peter be a coward at the time of Jesus' death and be bold in preaching in Jerusalem? If Dr. Pryor says that the myth of Jesus that he wrote from the dead started right at the beginning, why go into Jerusalem and preach? Because you'd soon be found out to be a liar. What changed Peter from being a coward to courageous? The account of Jesus' death has a ring of historical truth about it. In Mark chapter 16, 9, Mary Madeleine, a woman of ill repute, is the first to bear witness of Jesus. Why make a woman who has only half the testimony of a man in Jewish court, why make a woman the first witness of Jesus? In Mark, we learn that Jesus died on a cross in Mark 15, 25, 37. He was buried in a tomb by Joseph of Arimathea in Mark 15, 43. And he was seen in the resurrection by Mary Madeleine. This resurrection is stated a bold resurrection of Jesus. What is interesting, these facts that we affirm are facts that the vast majority of scholars would agree with. They wouldn't disagree with that. They might not agree with the supernatural interpretation, but they would not disagree with the basic facts that Christ died, the tomb was empty, and the church preached a resurrected Christ. So our research and our study confirm are confirmed in what scholars already accept. It falls in line with the work done by E.P. Sanders. So if our historical source material is in the first century, if it's reliable and based on eyewitness accounts, if it fits the historical context and accords with the scholarship of more scholars, I conclude the following. The idea that the disciples were lying makes no sense with the facts that we know. Why lie? What would they gain in lying? What would they gain in doing that? They gain no money, no sex, no power. People who start new movements aim at those three things. The disciples were not aiming at any of those things. If you were lying, why would you invent that your Messiah died, was a criminal, that died as a criminal? How would that enhance what you were trying to do? People would have just seen it as silly, so why preach it? If they lied, the enemies could have produced the body of Jesus and that would have exposed them. And why again preach in Jerusalem your lies? They would have been exposed in no time. How come nobody, if they were lying, how come not one of them recanted? When the disciples of him said they saw the golden plate, some later on went on to recant. What about delusions? Maybe they had an illusion or a vision. Well, it goes against the historical fact that the early church disciples believed in a physical resurrection. If it was an illusion or a vision, why do they insist on a real resurrection? Why not just say they had a vision? 
Why teach it was a physical resurrection? If it was an illusion, how could they recover from their defeat? When Jesus died, the disciples were defeated. They were not in a psychological fit state to respond to any vision or anything. They were utterly defeated. They had been beaten by this. They were not in a fit state to have visions. They were or to have grief, illus illusions. As they were so disappointed, so lost, so shattered, they were in no mental state to, be, to induce any such phenomena. Then the other option is, Jesus could rise from the dead. It fits all the historical facts. It makes perfectly clear why Peter was a coward one minute and bold the next. It makes sense to put Mary as the first witness because she just was. It happened. It makes perfect sense the disciples Jesus rose from the dead as they were crushed by Jesus' death and were not expecting anything. And then the next minute they could be bold. It makes perfect sense and that's why Mark told it. You might say miracles do not happen but that is just a philosophical argument and if you were honest you would say the only way to know if a miracle happened is to check the historical data. You might say there are minor contradictions within the Gospels on the historical resurrection. Those historical contradictions are only a way of looking at the Gospels. What about where all the Gospels agree on various historical facts? What about the fact that these so-called contradictions are really just a say that one Gospel says one angel, another Gospel says two angels, another Gospel says a man. It's obviously looking at things from a different perspective. If I say there was one angel at the tomb and my friend says there were two angels if they if I say there was only one and my friend said there was only two that would be a contradiction but if I say there was one angel and my friend says there were two angels I'm not being dogmatic I'm just giving you a general statement so when you say there are contradictions in the Gospels you're putting words in the mouth of the Gospels. You may say that Christianity came from Greek and Egyptian gods. Plutarch in Greek and Egyptian uh, gods shows there is no there was no belief in a dying and rising God that was central that could have influenced Christianity. Mary, Joe Sharp, a good scholar, has done a number of lectures on this showing that um, these ideas are not palatable, have no real historical basis whatsoever. In conclusion, I believe that there is a strong case here for the resurrection of Christ. I believe it's important to consider it. Anthony Flew said, the evidence for the resurrection is better for claimed miracles in any other religion. It is astoundingly different in quality and quantity. Gary Habermas, my pilgrimage from atheism to theism, an exclusive interview with former British atheist professor Anthony Flew, available from the website Biola University, www.biola.edu.edu. So we've, we've come to the end. Um, I've done this lecture before and I've said at the end of it, it doesn't prove the resurrection but it gives you good evidence for it. I would reconsider my statement. I would say um, 
that that is in one uh, lecture or other lectures I've given more detail so uh, I've said that there is solid proof for the resurrection um, but what I would say here is if you take the presuppositions the package of the worldview and the data itself you have solid grounds to believe that Christ rose from the dead Those are my conclusions. I just want to finish with some reflections on this. In the minimal fact approach, you normally go to the minutiae detail of the resurrection uh, of the cross and give evidence for that, and then the empty. In this argument, it was a very simple three pronged argument show that the Gospels are early source material, that is to say, first century. Show that the Gospels are historically reliable and then generally trustworthy. And then three, show that the Gospels are based in eyewitness material. Show that this information has been consistent in the historical document from the first and second century. And therefore, you have a strong case that Christ rose from the dead based on those facts. It's a broader approach than the minimal fact approach. All the other views that would come against my view such as um, Richard Carrier, Dr. Price, Bart Ehrman, none of these competing views would cover all the facts like, like um, the resurrection. So the Christian faith is in a very strong position in its proof that Christ rose from the dead. Um, again, I think that the debate has to be on the grounds of data and presuppositions. And I take a more nuanced position. I, I, I take presuppositions and facts go together. They can't be separated. So that's my um, talk today. Um, you can go and read Jesus and the Eyewitnesses by uh, Richard Balcom and um, basically the heart of the evidence is, is from that book really. Uh, the Minimal of Fact approach, you can look at The Resurrection of Jesus mm -hmm. by Dr. Lycona, IVP. Uh, and presuppositions and worldview, you can look at Cornelius Van Til if you go on Presuppositional 101. Go on the website, you'll be able to download presuppositions, uh, um, books on presuppositional apologetics. Um, so these are my thoughts, and uh, I hope they've been a stimulant to you. And I've kind of just gone over some of my ideas. I know that maybe it's over your head it, because we're talking about a lot of things in the academic world and a lot of philosophical and theological and historical ideas. But I did spend a lot of time on some of these issues because I wanted to get it off my chest. I thought there were issues that needed to be stated that are not being stated online, that are not being stated by websites that are not even being stated by professional academics. So I, I spent some time uh, on some issues because I felt that it's important. I haven't given a lot of time on data 
but I think that I paint a broad brush that would, should encourage you to believe in Christ and to not be intimidated by other people's beliefs who would criticize yours. you to go and study the scholars that are mentioned and um, you know learn about the subject and engage in the subject if you can so I'm going to invite you to come to know the Lord if you want to know Jesus today you want to believe in him trust in him follow him then I'm asking you to believe in him today I'm asking you to come to know him as your Lord and Savior I'm asking you to trust in him, to believe in him. That's what I'm asking. So let's come before the Lord. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you for your blessings. We give you the praise. We give you the glory today. And so, Father, we pray that you be with us now. Bless this lecture and may people come to know you as Lord and Savior. So Lord, I pray that you would bless in the name of you, Lord Jesus Christ. Bless us all. Bless every individual that watched this video. And may we all come to know you as our Lord and Savior. We praise you, Lord, in your name. Amen. Okay, I think that's it now. I think I'm going to make a cup of tea now, folks. And uh, so I'll leave... I'll leave the uh, comment section open. Please feel free to make comments. If the comments are stupid, if they're abusive, then you will be banned from the channel. So it's up to you. If you want to engage in debate and discuss, then write your arguments down. In a week's time, I'll come back and I'll, I'll give you my thoughts. If you just put abuse, uh, you'll be banned straight away. So uh, this is an opportunity for me to drop out or... Uh, if they want to debate and discuss, put your comments there and your arguments and I'll come back to you in a week's time. Uh, I'll make another video rebutting any arguments that might drop out or any atheist out there might want to put on. I'll make a video uh, rebutting what anybody said. All right. So it's an opportunity for atheists to come back and skeptics to come back and uh, say what they have to say uh, on the issue. All right. Thank you for listening and God bless you. Feel free to mirror this video if it promotes debate and discussion. And uh, God bless you all today.